When the legendary Chassid Mendel Futafaz was in prison, they gave every prisoner a candle. Every prisoner could use a candle for whatever they needed. The problem was, they gave out the candles on Friday night. So Mendel couldn't light the candle, it's Friday night. But one of his fellow prisoners, fellow inmates, a Gentile, sees the, he's his, sees the condition, he knows it's Shabbat, he knows he's got a lot of work on Shabbat, so he figures he'll help him out, and he lights the candle for him. And the problem is now is that not only is a Jew not allowed to light a candle on Shabbos, if a Gentile lights a, lights a candle for a Jew on Shabbos, he's not allowed to use that candle either. Mm-hmm. Yes, if a candle is lit by a Gentile for the sake of a Jew, you're not allowed to use it. So this Gentile lit the candle for the sake of the Mendel. So now this, this candle is not able to be used. So the Mendel asked the Gentile, would he mind switching candles? Because the candle, candle the Gentile lit for himself wasn't for a Mendel, it was for himself. So now he could switch candles, he could read from the candle the Gentile lit for himself, because it wasn't lit for the sake of a Jew. Great, he lit for himself. He's allowed to light a candle for himself. No sin was done by him lighting a candle for himself. He just can't light a candle for the sake of a Jew. That was a problem. Fantastic. Now the Mendel has a candle, and he has a candle. Great. The next Shabbos, the Gentile knows the drill. He goes in to, over to a Mendel, and he lights a Mendel's candle. And he lights his own candle. And he knows the drill, so he switches candles. But a Mendel realizes that means that when the Gentile lit the candle originally for a Mendel, a Mendel's candle, who do you have in mind? He had in mind himself. And when he lit his own candle, who do you have in mind? Remendel. So it means a candle lit for himself was the sake of, for the sake of Remendel. Therefore, it wasn't kosher to be used. So he asked the Gentile, would you mind switching back? <laughs> and the Gentile is incredulous. He, he can't believe it. He says, you Jews, everything you guys do is the opposite. Is the opposite. And the truth is, it is it's, it's, it's true. Jews are the opposite. But we're not embarrassed about this. In fact, we're proud of it. This week's Torah portion, Re'e means to see. And Hashem energizes and empowers us this week to see things in a deeper and higher way. The class tonight has been dedicated by Little Nishmas Pinchas Ben Yoy and also Little Nishmas um, Yisrael David Ben Shemto. Shem Shavn Aliyah and Begut the Better for his family for Ogre B'Seh Chal Yisrael. There are certain reactions we have to things naturally. Without even thinking, we have certain reactions to things. The Nishama, our deepest self, also has natural reactions to things. There are certain ways the Neshama naturally acts to things. When something happens to you, and it's a little bit out of the ordinary, you know what Jews do? Jews say, it's a miracle! It's a wonder! It's a blessing! It's a mazel! It was, it was, had, I came at it from Hashem Himself. If you have no way of explaining that it was a miracle, then you say it's natural. But Gentile, it's the opposite. Gentile, whatever he's happened, he says it's natural. If he has no choice, then he says it's a miracle. But a Jew, the natural... Um, center of gravity for a Jew is a supernatural. Our, our soul is our natural center of gravity and our soul is, is, is beyond nature. So our first way of explaining things is miraculous, divine providence. And that's the meaning of Hashem's instruction to us this week to look, to see. Hashem isn't talking about our vision. The Gemara says, if you see a woman who has beautiful eyes, you know that she's completely beautiful. She has beautiful eyes, the Gemara says, for sure she's totally beautiful. The Jewish people are called the bride of Hashem. We're called Hashem's bride. So, so this week, Hashem tells us, I want you to become more beautiful. How do you become more beautiful? By upgrading your eyes, upgrading your vision. Instead of looking at things externally, look at things more deeply. Instead of looking at things, just understanding them from a human, earthy perspective, understand them from a deeper, real perspective. In other words, we have many voices in our head. Hashem asks us this week, to concretize the reality of things. That should be real to us, what we know is real. The other voices we should put out, and we're supposed to pump up the volume of our eyes, what we know to be the absolute truth. We know what the absolute truth is. We're believers, children of believers. But we have other voices which, which confuse us, which try to interpret things differently. Let me give you a simple example. Sprinza asks Yankel to go to the store and buy a, 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 um, a quart of milk. He goes to the store and buys a quart of milk. If you ask the psychologist what happened, what does the psychologist say? This is an example of domestic harmony. She asked, and he answered, and he gave what she needed. This is domestic harmony. If you ask a 
a mechanic geek, what happened? So you turned the car on, and the starter went into the carburetor, and the carburetor went into pistons, and the pistons went into the generator, and, 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 and the, uh, the motor, that's what happened. If you ask a Jew what happened, an act of God, divine providence. This is what happened. Hashem caused this to happen. It's a divine act. So that's what the Torah is telling us, a, to look into our life and to see Hashem's hand in things. To see Hashem's, to see, to see the reality of things. Rabbi David Cohen just came back from Eretz Yisrael. Baruch Hashem, welcome back. We miss you. And it says about Eretz Yisrael, Hashem's eyes are upon the land all the time, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And in Eretz Yisrael, divine providence is more, is more openly clear than the rest of the world. But this week's Torah portion, Hashem instructs us to open our eyes and to look deeper. And this instruction of Hashem about beautifying our eyes, just like by a bride, if her eyes are beautiful, she's beautiful, so too in ourselves, when the way our vision is, that's how we are. Our vision affects all the, whole, the totality of who we are. The way we look at things, the way, is the way we react to things, the way we think about things, the way we feel about things. So this week Hashem empowers us to live on a higher level, to live deeper. You know, every time, this time, time of, every year, when this time of year comes, everyone has a certain attitude to the definition of what's happening at this time of the year. Some people, when El comes, the month of El comes, some people say, this terrible month, Oily va'ovili, woe is to me, El stands for, woe is to me, what a terrible month. But Hasidim say, El stands for, Ibra l'chaim, vidr l'chaim, say l'chaim once, say l'chaim twice, what an incredible month. Some Jews, even their last name is, Elul, Elulian. That's that's, that's Rabbi Elulian's last name. Elul, Elulian. That's what it's about. That's he loves El. So that's what he's all about. And the truth is, there are there are, there are two kinds of Elulians. There are two kinds of Elul's. I've had Elul's, which I'm very proud of that I did their things the right way, and I've Elul's that I'm embarrassed of. But I know this year, this year is going to be a good Elul. How do it's going to be a good year, a good Elul this year? I mean, for me, it's going to, not just for me. For everyone, it's going to be a good Elul. Why? I mean spiritually. I don't mean just Hashem will bless us. I mean also in our service of Hashem will be something better, something more. Let me just first explain what El is for a second. What is El? Moshe Rabbeinu was invited by Hashem to come to Mount Sinai, to come to heaven, to receive the second tablets. After the Jews sinned with the first ta- sinned with the golden calf, the first tablets were destroyed. Moshe prays to Hashem for forty days, and finally Hashem says, "I agree to forgive them." And the first of El Hashem says, Moshe, come back up the mountain, I'm going to forgive the Jewish people. So this entire period, from the first of El to Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is when Hashem actually gave us the second tablets, that's this whole time is a time of divine grace and mercy. And it's famously categorized by the parable that the altar gave about the king in the field. Or narrowly, the king's in the palace. Someone tries to see the king in the palace. They say, in fact, Mikan Kiyasti, who do you think you are going to the palace? Who you are? But during the month of El, the king is in the field. King is in the field, he greets everyone with a smiling face, shows everyone a beautiful face, he wants everyone to talk to him, he wants everyone to be with him. That's the month of El. The 13 attributes of mercy, of God's mercy, shines in El. It shines in a different way than the rest of the year. During the year, Hashem shows kindness to us, but in El, it's kindness on our souls. What's the difference? I'll tell you the difference. Someone asks you for help. Someone's car breaks down. And they ask you to help them to change their tire. Help them change. So you stop your car and you, you, you give them your, your, your jack and you try and you help. But what, you're, what, you're think, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about, I want to help this guy and move on. Somebody walks around the synagogue collecting tzedakah. You're thinking, if he passes by my table, I'm going to give him two. If he doesn't pass by my table, eh, I'm not going to give him. Why? Because it's just about you wanting to do an act of kindness for your conscience. It's not about you actually have a relationship with this person. And sometimes a person could ask you for a dollar, you're ready to give him a dollar, but you won't, say, you won't talk to him. You don't want, you want a relationship. It's, you could do kindness, but there's no relationship. The 13 attributes of mercy of Hashem the whole year are on our bodies, are on, the, are on our physical life, are on what's going on in our health, what's going on in our livelihood. Hashem gives mercy and gives us kindness. The attributes of mercy in the month of El are about our souls, about, our, about Hashem wants us to be closer to Him. Hashem shows mercy to us about, and He opens up to us for a relationship to Him. Hashem says, whatever happened throughout the whole year, I want to forgive you, I want you to come closer to me, the act, whatever happened throughout the year, I want to forgive you, I want to start over again. That's what happens month of El. It's not about just kindness, but kindness to the soul. It's about Hashem giving, Hashem welcoming us. It's about Hashem welcoming, welcome us, welcoming us back. So I know this year is going to be, go, be a good one. Why? Because there are two ways the month of El could fall out. One way is that El is blessed 
by the, the like this year by the Torah portion, which means to see. And the other way El could begin is the Torah portion, which means heal. What does heal mean? In, in, heal is the bottom of our foot. And it represents serving Hashem dryly. Just because you're supposed to, because you have to. But putting one foot in front of the other, it's a foundation of serving Hashem. Hashem said, so I've got to serve Hashem. But Re'e means to see that it's vivid, that it's enjoyable, that you like it, you get it, you're part of it. You see the king in the field, you, you see the value of your connection to Hashem. So this year, our launch bet for the whole year, is it's the whole year because Elul is the last month of the year. It's the way we correct the whole past year, we, the way we prepare for the coming year. And so the way Elul goes, the whole the way Rosh Hashanah goes, the Yom Kippur goes, the way Torah goes, the way the whole year goes. So this year, we're, our, our launch bet is Re'e, where Hashem asks us to look deeper, to look deeper and to see divine providence. The previous Shabbat said these words, Every single Jew could, lack, could look back at their past day, at their past week, and see that things happened the way they did not know how it was going to happen, and things worked out. Everyone could do this. So that's what the, 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 the Hashem is asking us, look deeper. But if you look in the first sentence of the Torah portion, everyone follow so far? Yes. So look deeper, look higher, and, and that's how you'll be higher. Your, your body will be higher. What's your body mean? Our body means our, our 248 limbs correspond to the 248 mitzvahs. Our 365 veins correspond to the 365 negative commandments. Our whole body, our whole performance in mitzvahs is affected by our, what we see. How, do we, how does our whole body become beautiful? By us upgrading the way we see things. If the kala's eyes are beautiful, she's all beautiful. If our eyes are beautiful, we upgrade the way we look at things, then, then our, everything we do, our shema is better, our shabbos is better, our kosher is better, it's all better. But I want to talk about today the first sentence of the Torah portion, which seems to be a little bit the opposite of, of, what, we're, of what I'm sharing so far. The first sentence of this Torah portion, you know what it is? Shem says, look, look, see, yes. I, I Hashem, I'm giving. That sounds good so far, right? And I'm giving it to you, you don't have to wait for it. I'm giving it to you today. Like someone tells you to give you something, you don't know what's going to happen. It doesn't feel so good. You don't know, you're, you're left confused. Shem says, look, I am giving it to you today. What am I giving you? A blessing. Wow, amazing. I'm giving you today a blessing. That sounds great. Then he adds another word. Uklala. And the opposite of blessing. Whoa, 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 one second. Who speaks like that? Look, I'm giving you today a blessing and a curse. Who, who, who is speaking? Why is he saying that? What does he mean? If, he's, if Hashem is talking to us and telling us he has a gift for us, I'm giving you something, then say blessing. If he wants to tell us about how we're supposed to behave in life then, and, and, and wants to warn us, then don't say the words, I'm giving you today, I'm giving you a present. What, what's a present over here? It's not a present, it's the opposite of a present. The answer is this. The Rechaim HaKadosh explains that you know who we're speaking over here? Moshe Rabbeinu. The author of this verse is not Hashem. The author of this verse is Moshe Rabbeinu. It's fascinating what he says. You, you, no one, it's a, it completely takes away the question to hold it from place. You, the question is, Hashem is saying, why is Hashem saying this? The answer is, what are you talking about? Hashem not even speaking. Moshe is speaking. Moshe is telling us something about his life experience. Moshe is saying, I lived through life. I, wa- I grew up in a lap of luxury in the Pharaoh's heart, house. I became very wealthy. When Moshe Rabbeinu was given the second tablets in his tent, it was all this, this sapphire and wealth. Moshe was, I'm very wealthy. I've been around the block. I know what the pleasures of this world are. I grew up in the Pharaoh's house. And I want to tell you that Listening to Hashem is good, not listening isn't good. Listening to Hashem is beneficial. In the language of the Medrash, Medrash gives a parable of a, a guy who goes to a city, sees there's two roads to the city. He asks the child, which way is the, is the way to the city? The child says, this road has some thorns, but after the thorns, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a comfortable road. The other road, it starts off comfortable, but there are a lot of thorns. So Moshe is telling the Jewish people, I want to tell you, there are two paths in life, and you pick the path of Hashem, it's a, it's a bracha. It's a blessing. It's worth it. It's worth it. There are paths. You've got to choose. And it may seem like, what's different? Choose this, choose that. So Moshe says, I want to tell you, I've experienced, I lived through life. You might say, I'm Moshe Rabbeinu who was on the mountain with God. What, I know, what do I know about your life? Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to share with you what my life experience. I want, I'm, not, I'm not telling you what to do. Like a lot of times, parents make this mistake and teachers make this mistake. They say, you should do this. You should do that. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I just want to tell you what I know. I want to tell you what I know. This is good, this is a blessing, this isn't good. He's telling us like a father, like a grandfather, like, like someone who wants to invite us 
into life and tell us there are different paths in life. And this one might be a little harder for you. But I want to tell you it's worth it. I'm in this with you. The famous parable that Rabbi Nachman of Breslov gave. Nachman talks about uh, this prince who became insane. And he thought he, thought he was a chicken. <coughs> Ever happened to you? Just suddenly feel like a chicken? Whatever. So this prince actually thought he was a chicken. So what did he do? He took off all of his clothing. He went under a table and started making chicken sounds. You know? And so the king had this problem with his naked son under his kitchen table making chicken sounds. And he doesn't know what to do with this guy. And he calls psychologists, psychiatrists, and nothing's working. So he calls this very gifted teacher. The gifted teacher comes, takes off his clothing, and he sits on the, under the table with the prince. And the prince is like, what are you doing here? He says, I'm a chicken. He says, you're a chicken, I'm a chicken. He says, yeah, I'm a chicken too. And then dinner comes. And the, the, and the, and the other chicken, not the prince, the new chicken, chicken number two, he starts eating steak. And the prince is like, what are you doing? He says, don't you know chickens eat steak? He says, oh, okay. And the, chicken, the prince starts eating steak too. Then the prince puts on pants, the, the chicken number two puts on pants. What are you doing? Don't you know chickens wear pants? So what, what Reb Nachman is conveying with the parable is, in order to help someone, you have to put yourself in their shoes. Moshe, when I was telling the Jewish people, I've been through life, I know what it's about. You know why Korach was jealous of me? Korach was jealous of me because I was richer than him. And I knew more. And, and, and Moshe said, I know what it's about. I know what life is about. I know, I know what wealth is about. I know what jealousy is about. I've lived through it. And I want to tell you, this is a good road. This road isn't so good. That's one explanation. The Mitzvah Rebbe, famously, he was talking to, Mitzvah Rebbe, people came from all over the world to speak to, 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 the, to all of our Rebbes. The second Rebbe of Chabad was once in the middle of a, giving an audience, and people were waiting in line. He said, I have to stop. I have to stop. Why well, have to stop? Amazing. He, before, when anyone comes to me, asks for advice, he said, I have to put myself in their shoes. I can't answer them until I'm in their, in their shoes. This guy came to me, and he did such a terrible sin, I couldn't identify with my, at all myself anything that it's a choice what this person did. And I couldn't talk to him until I figured out how I had this in me. Because in, in order to be able to help someone else, you have to find a relationship and something to do with that in yourself. That's what, one explanation. Moshe is the one who's speaking. But I want to show you a deeper explanation. Powerful, deeper explanation that the Rebbe explains. The Gemara says a story about this man named Marukva. Chil Binyam, you ever met Marukva? Uh, no, not yet. All right. Marukva was a very handsome man, very wealthy man. And he wanted to be with a certain woman who was married. And she, she was a very modest, pious woman. So when he said he wants to be with this woman, she, she shunned him. Her name was Chana. Chana shunned Marukva. Rabbeinu Nisim writes the story in detail. Mar says the story in four lines. Rabbeinu Nisim writes the story in great detail. Rabbeinu Nisim. Rabbeinu Nisim was, was one of the, uh, he was before Rashi. He was one of the Ga'inim. He's, the Gemara says in a few lines, it's the details of the story, amazing. He says that Marukva wanted to be with her so badly that he got sick. And the doctor said in order for him to live, he has to be with this woman. And they asked the rabbis, what should we do? The rabbi said, no way. The Jewish women are not, are not uh, zanious and are harlots. That's not, that's not how it works. So the doctor said, well, maybe it would be healthy for him, at least if she went over and just talked to him. Forbidden! Absolutely forbidden. Well, maybe if she went behind a wall and he heard her in voice from behind the wall, forbidden. Asur. Not kosher. He better, he, he better he die than he speaks to her. It's forbidden. It's, it's, it's better that he dies than he speaks to her. That's what the rabbi said. And he recovered. He got out of this depression. He recovered. And shortly after this, Hannah's husband got in trouble. He borrowed some money. He couldn't pay back. Apparently he borrowed from people he shouldn't have, shouldn't have gotten in trouble with, he went to jail. And his, his wife, his poor wife, Hannah, would come to him every day and bring him bread and water. And she, would very dutifully, would help him every day with the bread and water, but he wasn't appreciative. He yelled at her, you don't care about me, you leave me in prison. What do you want me to do? I'm, I'm this poor lady who has this irresponsible husband <laughs> who got stuck in the jail. What do you want me to do? It's because of you I'm in jail. What do you mean because of me? What do you want me to do? He says, if you cared about me, you would find the money to get me out of jail. He says, how should I find the money to get you out of jail? He says, you ever asked this guy Marukva? Marukva? You're serious? You want me to go? Are you crazy? I should go to Marukva? I go to Marukva. So she, so she goes to Marukva. Marukva says, how much money do you want? 
So there's 10,000. So here's 30. Keep the change. Um, now let me tell you the price. So she says, I'm in your hands. I can't do anything. I need you. I'm in your hands. But I want to tell you something. She told him something else. I'll tell you in a second what she told him. And because of what she said, he instantaneously became, did tshuva. He did tshuva in the spot. He gave the money, and he didn't, he didn't go, and, and, and that was it. She left. She, she, ran, she, she redeems her husband. And her husband is redeemed. Her, she, he, he separated from his wife. He said, I know what you did with Marukva. I know how you got the check. How else you got the check? You must have sinned with him. It wasn't true. But he suspected her of sinning with Marukva, otherwise how'd you get the check? So, so, what happens is, Rabbi Kiva is walking with his students. Rabbi Kiva sees this man driving on a horse. Rabbi Kiva says, wow, go call that man, I want to talk to him. The students are like, that man, you know that man is? That's the man who caused his husband and wife to separate. He says, yeah, that's the guy I want to speak to, let me speak to him. What are you talking about? I said, why are you saying that it's about him? That's terrible. Don't say it about him, it's not true. He comes down from the horse. Rabbi Kiva says, can you come to my synagogue? I want to learn with you every day between Mincha and Meir. Come to my synagogue between Mincha, I want to learn with you. The guy's like, okay, great. He comes to the synagogue. All the students are wondering, who, what, what's your kid doing? This guy is such a terrible person. He is the one who causes husband and wife to separate. He's the one who broke a family. Why is he inviting, why is he inviting this guy to, 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 to the synagogue? They can't believe it. Rabbi Kiva says, you don't know what this guy is. His name is Natan, who, of, the man of light. From his face is shining a light. Natan. Natan. Natan de Nitsyusa. Natan, whose, whose, whose face is sparkling with, 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 with light. That was his real name. So, so one day the husband of the woman comes to the shul. And the husband sees this guy sitting in the shul. He goes to Rabbi Kiva. Says, this guy? This guy's in your shul? You know what this guy did to me? Rabbi Kiva said, it's not true. I promise you it's not true. And he believes Rabbi Kiva and goes back to his wife and they had a happy life together. The question though is, what did she say to him? So what she said to him is what the, the Targum translates this first verse in the, of, of Parsha Sarei. The Hashem says to every Jew, I'm giving you a blessing and I'm giving you also the opposite. Chilufay. Chilufay means the switch. The switch. What does the switch mean? It doesn't say a curse. The way he translates it is Targum Yenison. I'm giving you the switch. What's the switch? He says, I'm giving you the switch. What's the switch? He said, what he means is like this. Why is it Hashem creates in a person a burning desire to do the wrong thing? Look into the evil, Hashem says. You see in yourself, you're drawn to something which is not for you. You see there's something in you that's pulling you the wrong way. Look deeply into that. Who is creating that? Why is he creating that? This woman told Marukva, she said to him, is, she said to him, Hashem is now giving you a chance. A chance that you could have the world to come. Be strong. And don't allow a fleeting pleasure to ruin something for you for, the, for your whole future. This is a chance. Hashem is giving you a chance to be able to go to the world to come. By you overcoming your desire right now, you don't understand. Hashem is giving you something forever. The true goodness of the world to come. And when she said it to him, he realized that, that this is a reality. He realized that yes, he has this burning desire to be with this woman. On the other hand, he also realized that this was just a test. Let me explain. There was this guy who was very arrogant, very arrogant guy. And he comes to the rabbi, he says, Rabbi, you know who I am? I'm an arrogant man. I'm always full of arrogance. Whatever happens, I'm always a guy pushy, shoving, and I don't know how to stop my arrogance. I'm a, a mufchar. Mufchar, right? Is that the right word? So the rabbi says, you're making a big deal out of nothing. You don't have this problem. But the rabbi calls over his gabbai. Goes over the Gabai. This this rich man in the synagogue was a guy who always got the, the most uh, honorable aliyah. Some shows that's shishi, some shows that's mafter, some shows that's shlishi. He was the one who got the best one. The uncle always got the best aliyah. The, he, the rabbi the, he calls over the Gabai. He says, this, time, this, this week, don't give this guy shishi, don't give him shlishi, don't give him mafter, give him galila. Galila is given off in the children. So it's, it is a very honorable thing to do, but not everyone realizes it. Not this guy for sure. So the Gabai is like, he knows what's going to happen. If he gives him Galila, all hell will break loose. 
So he goes with the guy before sh- in the morning, Shabbos morning. The rabbi said he had to give him glitter and say, he couldn't say, can't tell him. He said, I want to tell you. Did today, you're not getting him after, you're getting Kalila. So the guy's saying, okay, whatever, the rabbi wants to set me up, whatever, he wants to think of, I'll, I'll, and I'll show him that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to handle it. And after Shabbos, the rabbi goes over to him and says, no, what do you think about getting Kalila today? He says, Rabbi, I knew you set me up, big deal. I knew it was a setup. So the rabbi says, and what do you think life is? Life is also a setup. You knew you were being set up. That's how you're able to overcome the challenge. Mm-hmm. The whole life is a setup. When you see Hashem creates in you, the Rebbe says, that this kind of desire, that's a, a desire of your animal soul, which is for something in this world. And it's stronger than desires of the godly soul. To ask of what is the purpose of that? Why Hashem create that? It's because of the great light that's created from the darkness. So Hashem says, I'm giving you a blessing, and then I'm giving you chilufe. I'm giving you the ability to create light from the darkness. You know what Rabbi Kiva said about this man, Marukva? He said a light, he's calling the man, not that did it snooze so why? Because a light shines from why light shines from him? Because he resisted the temptation. That's why light shines from him. Every time a Jew overcomes temptation, he creates a light of Hashem that's that as the Zohar says, um your a Jew subdues evil, he causes the glory of Hashem to be revealed infinitely, infinitely. So Hashem tells us this Elul that we have we have two paths. Hashem tells us I wanted to choose the one that's good for you. The one that's a, the path of the king in the field, and this is this is a mantra that opens all the doors for us to start anew, to start fresh, to have a relationship with Hashem. And it's not easy to do all the things we're supposed to do in Elul. It's it's not so, a lot of things we have to do, which you have to you know, you have to get up earlier. Baruch Hashem, Sfarim get up early every every day of the month of Elul. Baruch Hashem, Ashkenazim not every day, <laughs> but a little bit earlier. The previous, a little bit earlier, supposed to get up every day in Elul. It's supposed to add in davening, add in learning. And it's not, not always so easy to add in learning and giving staka. We have to realize that, that even when we're challenged to do the wrong thing, that challenge is created by Hashem. Hashem created, gave us the, power, the blessings, also the ability to switch, to switch the circumstances that we're in and to see what's beneath the surface. And, and this, is, this is what brings the light of the coming of Mashiach in the world. When a Jew is in a situation of confusion and he chooses the right thing, he makes a choice, Hashem created, gives the ability to choose that's what brings the Ur HaGu'ul, the light of redemption, light of Mashiach in the world. We should see back in ourselves the strength we have. Hashem gives us, look inside ourselves, what the, inner, the inside of who we are. Look inside the world, or the reality of the divine providence in the world. And even look inside the evil, look inside the challenges. What's inside the evil? What's the purpose of the evil? It's only for the greater light that comes out of it. L'chaim, l'chaim,